The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. The Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, Is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, What did Moses command you? They replied, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. But Jesus told them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. In the house, the disciples again questioned Jesus about this. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And people were bringing children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he became indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen, I say to you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Then he embraced them and bless them, placing his hands on them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The relationship between science and religion has been very much to the fore in the recent years. That relationship has often been expressed as one of conflict, for example, between scientists who called to an evolutionary view of the emergence of the world and its life forms, and creationists who hold that the world was created just as the book of Genesis says it was. However, many scientists and religious believers have come to realize that there is not real conflict between science and religion. The Bible is not a scientific book uh, and does not make scientific claims. It makes different kind of claims, and in, in language that is often highly symbolic, claims about God and about God's relationship with us and our relationship with Him and each other. The story of the creation of man and woman by God in the second chapter of the book of Genesis a section of which we have in today's first reading, it is not a scientific account of creation of the first human couple. Rather, it is a symbolic portrayal of the relationship between man and woman and between them and God. The first reading suggests that the woman is to stand alongside the man as his equal. She, cor she corresponds to him exactly as the man affirms, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Whereas to the man names the animals suggesting a certain authority over them, he does not name the woman. The primary relationship between the man and woman 
is adult human to adult human. From the beginning, God entrusted men and women to relate to one another as mutual partners. According to our first reading, that relationship of mutual partnership between a man and a woman find its full, fullest expression in marriage. A man leaves his father and mother and joins himself to his wife, and they become one body, one flesh. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus turns to this text from the book of Genesis when he is pulled when he is put on the spot by some Pharisees regarding the question of divorce. His teaching on marriage went against the grain in the Jewish world of his time. The Jewish law made provision for divorce. The only issue of debate among the religious leaders was the reason of divorce. One school of religious leaders favored very lenient reasons. Another school instead insisted sorry, on much strict reasons. However, both schools followed the Jewish law in asserting that it was only the man who could initiate divorce proceedings, whatever the reasons. The woman has not free to do the same. The divorce law gave a freedom to men that it did not give to the women. And it left women very vulnerable to being caught adrift by their husbands, sometimes for the for the flimsy, the flimsy of reasons. In that context, Jesus' teaching was intended to protect, protect women. It reminded men of their obligation to love and honor their wives as they would their own body, rather than seeing her almost as a piece of property that they could dispose of when it suited them. When Jesus, Jesus went back beyond what the Jewish law allowed God's original intention as expressed in the book of Genesis, according to which husband and wife are to become one loving union. There is a wonderful vision of marriage here. St. Paul developed it when he stated that the loving union between a husband and wife is a reflection of the loving union between Christ and his church and that, and that husbands are to love their wives and wives their husbands as Christ loves the church. Those couples who still come to the church to be married are attracted by this vision of married love. It is not surprising that the most frequently chosen reading for the wedding mass is Paul's great hymn of love. Love is patience, love is kindness. Here indeed is Jesus' vision of married love, the spelling out of what it means to live as one body. We know from our own experience that not all marriage reflects the ideal of loving communion that Jesus places before us in today's Gospel reading. Many of us have relatives, relatives and friends whose marriages have not lasted. The Gospels are clear that although Jesus presented a challenging vision for a human relationship, including within marriage, he related with love and understanding to those whose relationships fell short of his vision and calling. All of us, married or single, are called to love one another with the Lord's own love, and we all fail in our response to that call. It is in those moments of weakness 
that the second part of today's gospel reading has most to say to us. Anyone who does not welcome the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. We all need to stand before the Lord with a childlike heart in our weakness and vulnerability, open and receptive to the great gift of the Lord's unconditional love, being aware that we are much more dependent on God than we are one, one each other. We need more we need far more from God than God needs from us. There is much we can give to God. We can give God our love, our worship, our service. But what we can give to God is very little compared to what God can give us to us. When we welcome the Lord's gift of his love with the openness of a child, we will receive from him the strength to keep moving towards that vision of love he puts before us. 